This is a lecture on products liability. It is the introductory lecture, and in this lecture I'll explain to you how the general system works, and then there are lectures on the various parts of the system. In general, there are several theories of liability for a defective product. There are three major theories and three minor theories. The three major theories for liability for a defective product are negligence, uh, strict liability, and breach of warranty. The three minor theories for a defective product are intent, which results in a battery, the uh, intentional misrepresentation, This amounts to, this is fraud. So you used the elements of fraud if you think it was there. Use the elements of battery if you think they were there. And finally, the misrepresentation to the public. This happens at, the rule about this is at 402B, and it is basically says that uh, uh, you're, there's liability if the, if the uh, manufacturer or whoever the seller is makes a, uh, makes a uh, misleading or misrepresentation to the public regarding the product. Usually it's on the label of the product or it's an advertising for the product and there's strict liability for those, that kind of conduct. Uh, misrepresentations on the label or misrepresentations in advertising. So these are the six theories of products liability uh, and we're going to talk briefly about each of these theories then there's a separate lecture that goes into each of these in depth. The negligence theory of liability for defective product is based on evaluating the conduct of the party that you're claiming was negligent. There are only three people involved here uh, who may be liable for their negligence. The retailer, the wholesaler, the manufacturer. The retailer can be negligent in dealing with your product in really only two ways. Uh, they can be negligent in, uh, in that they negligently selected a supplier. So this is negligent selection. Uh, and this means that if they select a buyer for a product who makes shoddy goods and they have reason to know that, like other people have complained, and the retailer uh, continues to use this same supplier to make shoddy goods, they are liable. That's negligent conduct, and they will be liable in negligence for negligent selection of a supplier. The other way that the retailer can be negligent is failure to warn. That is to say, if the retailer already knows that uh, this product may be dangerous because maybe someone else has been injured by it, and they don't warn you about it, that is another way that the retailer can be negligent. When you are evaluating the negligence of the retailer, you use the regular rules of negligence, duty, <clears throat> the retailer owed a duty to the purchaser or whoever was suing, they owed a duty of due care. You show that the 
retailer breached the duty of due care usually by one of these methods, then you go through the usual causation, actual proximate causation, damages, and defenses, like any other negligent problem. The wholesaler was also in the commercial chain of distribution. Really, it's very difficult for the wholesaler to be negligent, and that affects the uh, consumer in any way. Because usually, the wholesaler just buys the goods in, in, in bulk and passes them on to the retailer. So that it's very difficult for the wholesaler to be negligent. Difficult to be negligent. So we don't, you mention them, but you don't usually have a suit against the wholesaler. Now the wholesaler can be negligent, for example, if the wholesaler bought the goods from one person and in the course of delivering them, they dropped them and uh, it, it's cans of tuna and some of the cans got punctured because of the drop and now the tuna is rotten. Well, uh, that kind of negligent handling by a wholesaler would make the wholesaler liable, but it would take something of that sort to make a wholesaler liable for negligence. Now mind you, we're just talking about negligence. In strict liability, everyone in the commercial chain of distribution is strictly liable if the product was defective when it left them. We're not talking about strict liability, we're talking about negligence. Next we come to the manufacturer. Now, the manufacturer is the person who is most likely to have, become, to have been negligent. And the, there are lots of ways that the manufacturer can be negligent. The manufacturer can be negligent in the design of the product, in the manufacture of the product. Now, we're just breaking down the manufacturing process into these very steps so that if you have a problem where uh, there was some negligence, you can put it into one of these categories and then explain why what the, the manufacturer did created an unreasonable risk of harm First, the duty. Manufacturer owed a duty to the foreseeable plaintiff, who was the consumer, uh, and that they breached this duty, causation, proximate cause, damages as usual. Uh, negligent in the manufacturing process. <coughs> uh, uh, there's inspection. They can be negligent in the testing. Be negligent in the shipping, in the packaging, in um, in the instructions, in the warning. So the manufacturer can be negligent in any of these ways. If you find some way where you believe the manufacturer was negligent in that regard, uh, do the usual negligence analysis. That first of all, the manufacturer had a duty to the foreseeable plaintiff, who was either the consumer or somebody who was affected by the use of the product. That's a foreseeable plaintiff. If I uh, buy a bicycle uh, from a retailer, well, the manufacturer made the bike and they sold it to the wholesaler who sold it to the retailer. Then someone bought the bike and while riding the bike, the handlebars came off and I hit a pedestrian. Well, the pedestrian is a foreseeable plaintiff for a bicycle. So you, uh, you, if you have a manufacturing negligence, establish the duty to the foreseeable plaintiff first. Breach of duty us using the usual methods to establish breach of duty. That is the negligence per se violation of the standards of a profession or skill, the uh, uh, res ipsa, and the balancing test. So use any of those methods to establish the breach of duty, then do causation, just as you usually do, usually do, and proximate causation and damages and defenses. Don't forget the damages and defenses, because they often put a lot of points in the defenses part. So if you are suing based on negligence, and again, over here, negligence is one of the several theories of products liability. If you're suing based on negligence, then your cause of action is going to look like either this, this, or this, depending on who the defendant is. Again, keep in mind that when you sue for negligence, you're suing on the theory 
that, that the person you're suing uh, engaged in some conduct, which was negligent conduct. Now, the second theory of products liability was strict liability. Uh, it can be either one, strict liability or breach of warranty. Take strict liability. In the case of strict liability, the key thing is that we're looking at the product, not the conduct of people. We're looking at the product itself, the car, the hammer, whatever it was, and the question is, is that product defective? Because if the product is defective, there are two rules that apply, second restatement and the third restatement. The second restatement has basically been adopted every place, uh, the, uh, by every place, I mean throughout the United States. The third restatement is now coming on, and a lot of states have adopted the third restatement. And they have slightly different rules for when someone is liable for a defective product. The second restatement rule says a person is liable if uh, the product is in a defective condition, unreasonably dangerous, and it's a commercial seller and someone gets injured. The third restatement breaks this down into uh, three kinds of defects, manufacturing defects. You'll see this when we do this um, in detail. There are manufacturing defects. Manufacturing defects, defects, design, and failure to warrant. So the third restatement of torts uh, gives the standard for what makes a product have a manufacturing defect, what constitutes a design defect, what constitutes a defect and failure to warrant. Product is defective because a failure to put warnings on them. So in a strict liability uh, part of the problem, in products liability, you need to go through each of these three when you're applying the third restatement of torts. Next, the third theory for breach of, uh, for products liability is breach of warranty. Now, there are several warranties that one might make. One is the express warranty. The express warranties that are 2-313 of the UCC. And uh, there are lots of things that can constitute an express warranty. For example, a model, a sample, a description, uh, a promise, any of that sort of thing. Uh, even the label itself, even the name of the product can be an express warranty. For example, there was one product on the bar exam where the bar examiners uh, were, the product being sold was a product called Bayban. It was a birth control pill called Bayban. Well, the title itself tells you what the, uh, what, the, what the seller is promising, what the manufacturer is promising. This will ban babies. And if it didn't, the product is arguably, you have an express warranty and the product may very well be defective. So the breaches of warranty, there are three of them here, express warranty, and there are two implied warranties. There's an implied warranty at 2-314. And this is the warranty of merchantability. The warranty of merchantability says that the product is of merchantable quality, fit for the use that it was intended. And this is a major testing area. The implied warranty is a 2-314, in particular the warranty of merchantability. Uh, but in addition to the warranty of merchantability, 2-314 also has implied warranties that uh, the product is adequately packaged, adequately labeled, that it conforms to what the label says it is, adequate instructions about how to use it, adequate warnings about dangers. So all that stuff is in 2-314, and it is very common in a product's liability question on the bar for you to have to use that code section. And finally, there is the implied warranty at 2-315. This is the one saying that the, the product is fit for a particular purpose. In this case, the seller, the commercial seller, needs to represent to the buyer 
that this product is fit for the purpose that they say they want to use it for. There was a case where the person came to a, a sporting store and said, I want to do some mountain climbing. And so the store recommended a particular set of boots for that, and rock climbing actually. And the boots that, uh, the shoes that were recommended had plastic soles. And so when this person went rock climbing in the mountains with plastic soles, of course he slipped and fell and there was a lawsuit. And the suit is based on the breach of the implied warranty that the product is fit for a particular purpose. Now this only applies if the commercial seller represents that the product is fit for a particular purpose and it turns out it's not. 2-315. So in the case of breach of warranty, these are the three theories that need to be applied. And please notice that in breach of warranty, the suit is based on a promise. See, in strict liability, the suit is based on the product being defective. In breach of warranty, it's based on a promise that's been made. And in the case of negligence, it's based on conduct of the person, all three of those suits. Finally, we come to the privity problem. And the, uh, and the privity problem is illustrated by this diagram. Here we have the retailer. And an injured party was injured either by negligence of somebody in this, here's a district commercial chain of distribution, retailer, wholesaler, manufacturer, supplier of parts to the manufacturer. And if this person was injured by negligence, uh, that's one case, person may be injured by strict liability, but because the product is defective uh, and you use strict liability theory, it may be injured because of breach of warranty, uh, either one of the warranties are either the implied warranty or the express warranty. Let's go through these one at a time. First of all, when someone is sued for negligence, this is a suit that is against whoever actually committed the negligence. That is to say, if the manufacturer was negligent, you can't sue the retailer for that negligence. If the retailer was negligent, you can't sue the manufacturer. You sue whoever was actually negligent. And so the, uh, the injured party uh, sues, the, the, the liability extends to any foreseeable plaintiff, and the person who is liable is whoever was negligent. Could be the retailer, for example, a retailer could be liable by failing to warn the, the uh, uh, customer or by using a uh, unreliable source. So the retailer can be negligent in which case any foreseeable plaintiff can sue the retailer based on this negligence theory. Uh, but if you sue someone based on a negligence theory, what you get is the damages. You get uh, damages for, the, for personal injury. You get the damages for uh, any physical harm that occurred because of the negligence. And what some people would like to do is to also be able to collect for two other things. One is the, uh, uh, the damage to the very item that you bought. In other words, if I bought a car from you and the car caused me was defective, somebody acted negligently in building the car, and let's suppose I got injured. Well, I can sue whoever was negligent in building the car, uh, but uh, suppose instead of me being the I, mean, I bought the car now. Suppose instead of me being the person who was injured, Suppose it was someone in my family who was driving the car. Suppose it was a friend who, who was driving the car. Suppose somebody stole the car and they were driving the car. So these people get further and further removed from me. And the rule is that when, if the person qualifies as a foreseeable plaintiff using regular negligence standards, then that person can sue for negligence. And the person they sue is the one who was actually negligent. Could be the retailer could be the wholesaler, could be the manufacturer, could be the supplier of parts. Uh, the, uh, uh, next, if the person who was injured is suing based on a strict liability, I'm sorry, getting back to here, I said that if this person is suing on a negligence theory, they, uh, they need to be a foreseeable plaintiff and the person they can sue needs to be the one who actually committed the negligence. Now, uh, the, uh, 
so we so we know who can be sued, where did the negligence, we know who can sue them. Now if we come to uh, the, the second case I wanted to mention was, let's see, I was saying there were, yeah, one is where the, where the person might be suing for the, the, I bought a car, let's go back, I bought a car, I bought it from a manufacturer I, or somebody, and they were negligent, and I am suing for negligence. When I sue for negligence, besides the damage to my body, maybe damage to some property that was caused by the car, that I might sue to try to collect the damages to the car itself. And thirdly, uh, I might sue to try to collect my economic loss. In other words, I can't use the car. I use it in my business. And I can't use it and I lost profits because of that. Now, so we're looking at different damages now. One is my personal injury. I can certainly collect that. Per property damage that caused by the, diff the steering wheel broke and it ran into somebody's house. We can get that fixed. Okay. But how about injuries to the car itself? And secondly, my loss of profits from I intended to use the car. If you're suing in negligence, if you have pure loss of profits, that is uh, without any physical personal injury or physical damage, I just have loss of profits. In other words, the car didn't work the way it was supposed to. Uh, it broke and I lost profits. Well, you cannot collect that on a negligence theory. Okay, you use the UCC uh, for a sale of goods and collect what you can based on that. So uh, any, like in any negligence case, you cannot ordinarily collect pure economic loss. I'm driving across the Golden Gate Bridge person ahead of me was negligent. They caused a blockage of traffic for an hour. And now I want to sue for being late to work for an hour. That's a pure economic loss. No personal injury to me, no damage to my car. You cannot get that in a negligence action, as you know, from having studied negligence. So if I sue for a pure economic loss because of the defective car, I, won't, I will not get it under negligence theory. However, if, I'm, if I am injured, and I can't go to work because I'm injured, or if there's other physical uh, uh, injury, damage, then I can collect the loss of uh, profits that are caused by that damage. You're damaged by the person, damaged my building, and so uh, I'm closing up shop. I can't produce my goods anymore for a while. They injured me personally. I'm in a hospital. I can't go to work. So if my damage, my personal injury or property damage is connected to some other physical law is connected to, pardon me, if, if my person, if my, uh, if my, uh, if my loss of economic gain is connected to a physical injury or property damage, I can collect it. If it's by itself, I cannot. Secondly, uh, if the vehicle itself that was damaged when I try to collect my damage because I bought a car from you, I bought a hammer from you, whatever it is, <clears throat> doesn't work right, cause harm, and now the car itself has been damaged or the hammer has been damaged. Can I collect for that? And the general rule is no, that you have to do that under a UCC theory. Next, suppose that the person injured is suing based on strict liability. Well, again, the person who can sue is a foreseeable plaintiff, just the usual foreseeable plaintiff. And they can sue on strict liability everyone in the commercial chain of distribution if the product was defective when it left that person. So if the supplier supplied correct parts, but the manufacturer made the mistake, then the person can sue the retailer, wholesaler, manufacturer, but not the supplier of parts because the product was not defective when it left the supplier. So in a strict liability, can sue everyone in the commercial chain if the product was defective when it left that person. Um, again, if you're suing based on strict liability, this person who's being who is suing needs to be a foreseeable plaintiff. The defendant can be any of these people. Uh, but once again, you cannot, just as in negligence cases, you cannot collect for pure economic loss, and you cannot collect for the damage to the product itself in most jurisdictions.
Nowhere can you collect pure economic loss. Most jurisdictions, there's a split of authority actually, in most jurisdictions you cannot recover for damage to the product itself. In a few you can. If the person suing is suing based on an implied warranty of merchantability or fit for a particular purpose, in the in case of the implied warranty, uh, who can sue? And the answer is that under the UCC, A, B, or C, 2-318, this obviously will go into this in more depth in the lecture on warranties, but A says the person who can sue needs to be family or a guest. B says the person who can sue is anyone who is a person expected to be affected by the use of the product. But A and B both apply only to personal injury. And C, on the other hand, applies to property damage. So both of these apply to personal injury. This is family or guest. <clears throat> family or guest. Take a look at the code. Family of the person who bought it, the purchaser, or that person's family or guest, household guest, can sue for personal injury only. B says anyone expected to be affected by the use of the product. So if I bought a bicycle from you, pedestrians are expected to be affected by the use of the product. So a pedestrian could sue, even though they're not family or guests, if the jurisdiction has adopted B. The majority rule, most jurisdictions have adopted A. Uh, some jurisdictions have adopted B and a few C. C says that uh, you can re they can recover not just for personal injury. Remember, A and B are limited to personal injury. C includes property damage, but does not include damage to the very item that the person bought. Uh, California uh, has basically ignored these and has said any foreseeable plaintiff can recover. So California is broader than any of these. So if the person is suing on basis of an implied warranty, the person who can sue is a person fits under A, B, or C, depending on which what the jurisdiction has adopted. And in California, they just need to be a foreseeable plaintiff. So that's who can sue. Now, who can be sued? The person who can be sued, if it's an implied warranty, uh, you can sue the person who made the implied warranty. The retailer made an implied warranty when the retailer sold to the customer. But the wholesaler and manufacturer also made implied warranties, which they uh, made when they sold to each other on the way down the, the chain of distribution. And those, the, the, the customer can sue any of these people uh, who sold the product further up the chain. That is to say, you buy a car from a retail car dealer and, and there's a breach of implied warranty, you can sue the retailer, you can sue the wholesaler, you can sue the manufacturer because they all made the implied warranty and this person can sue on it. Now, if the suit is based on, on intangible uh, injuries, so that I'm trying to get my lost profits, and that's all I'm trying to get, well, that really, you normally can't get that uh, for suits for a strict liability. You can't get your pure lost profits. And for negligence, you cannot get your pure economic harm. But in the warranty cases, we're looking more at contract law, though warranty is a mixture of the two. And under contract law, you can collect for damages which were foreseeable at the time the contract was formed. And if you made some unusual damage foreseeable, uh, if you made under Hadley versus Baxendale, if you did enough so that the other party understood you were going to suffer this damage if there was a breach, then you can collect that damage. So Hadley versus Baxendale applies to these pure economic losses here. Uh, and these pure economic losses, uh, you, you might be able to recover those. Uh, if you have pure economic loss, like loss of profits, you might be able to recover that from the retailer if the retailer understood uh, that you would suffer this damage if the product was defective. 
But these special damages, these are specialized or consequential or Hadley versus Baxendale damages, the people further up, the wholesaler and the manufacturer, you know, would have no way of knowing about the special circumstances uh, of the customer who says, I'm going to have a unique type of injury if the product doesn't work right. So the implied warranty, you can usually sue the retailer if Hadley versus Baxendale will let you, but you cannot go further up because these people had no idea of the nature of the use that the customer was going to uh, make, and therefore they would be li therefore they're not liable for any harm that comes from that use that they know nothing about. In other words, these specialized or consequential damages, you cannot sue up the line for those, but you can sue up the line for ordinary uh, damages for breach of warranty, damage to persons, damage to property. Finally, comes the case of the express warranty. And no matter where you are in this chain, if you make an express warranty, it's assumed that it uh, was intended to, to a recipient. You advertised, for example, an express warranty, or you put it on the label. So an express warranty, uh, uh, whoever it, the message was intended for, that's a person to whom the warranty was made. And whoever the, whoever the warranty was made to, that's a person who can sue. And so this person can sue certainly the retailer based on an express warranty and will probably be able to sue further up based on the express warranty. But even with the express warranty, they still cannot sue for consequential damages because the people further up the line would have no reason to know of this particular use and particular injury that the person is going to receive. So that brings us, that is uh, what this product's liability area is all about. It is, first of all, there are several theories of liability for a defective product. The three major theories are negligence, strict liability, breach of warranty. The three minor theories are intent, battery, use the regular rules of battery, Intentional misrepresentation, that's fraud, use the regular rules of fraud. And misrepresentation to the public, that is someone who uh, labels or advertises a product and misrepresents in the process is strictly liable under 402B. So the three theories then that we have real work to, uh, to do are negligence, strict liability, and breach of warranty. As to the negligence claims, uh, the three people who can be negligent are the retailer, wholesaler, and manufacturer. Retailer can only be negligent by negligent selection or failure to warn. The wholesaler is hard to find a situation where the wholesaler was, was negligent and affected the consumer, but you could. And finally, the manufacturers engaged in a whole host of activities and could be negligent in any of those activities, including design, manufacturing, inspection, and so forth. The, uh, the strict liabilities are next. Uh, it's a theory and the rules for strict liability. There are rules in the second restatement, rules in the third restatement. You should do them both on the exam because the third restatement has been adopted by a lot of states now and is growing rapidly. Uh, the third theory, breach of warranty, three kinds of warranty, express warranty, implied that the product is merchantable, implied that the product is fit for a particular purpose. And uh, one can sue for breaches of those, but there's a privity problem with these warranty cases. And uh, the, in negligence, we don't have a privity problem. Uh, you sue whoever was negligent, and the foreseeable plaintiff can sue. Strict liability, the foreseeable plaintiff can sue. But, uh, the damages you get here are just like other negligence and strict liability cases where you cannot get pure economic harm. In the case of breach of warranty, you can get uh, personal injury if the jurisdiction has adopted A or B um, to guess. A says guess the purchaser or the purchaser's family or household guest, they can sue. B, anyone expected to be affected by the use of the product can sue. But A and B both apply to personal injury only. C applies to uh, property damage also. So these are the people who can sue. Who can you sue? You can sue the retailer who made the implied promise 
wholesaler or manufacturer, any of those people. Uh, if you're suing for uh, consequential damages, uh, then uh, you can only sue the retailer because the people further up the line would not have uh, uh, would not have been foreseeable to them that your consequential damages would occur. And finally, if you're suing on the basis of an express warranty, the express, person made an express warranty wherever they are in the chain that uh, whoever the warranty was intended for, if that person injures, gets injured, that's who can sue. Uh, and that is our introduction to products liability. There are full lectures on the other parts of it, and that is the end of this lecture.